It's a big world out there with plenty of things to do and places to explore. But it's a world with a lot of big problems to solve, like pollution and global warming. It's time we all work together to solve them. So, where do we start? The first step is learning all that we can about the space. And then figuring out ways to solve them. We call that exploring. Right now, we're going to explore solar, solar power. power. Solar power is defined as the energy we produce from the conversion of sunlight into heat or electricity. And since the sun bathes the earth with more energy each minute than the world consumes in an entire year, it is one of the most abundant forms of energy there is. For more than a century, however, we've burned fossil fuels, either oil, coal, or natural gas to generate electricity. There was plenty of it under the ground, and it was easy to get. Problem is, fossil fuels are a non-renewable resource, which means they're nearly impossible to replace when they are used up, and they generate pollution when they are burned. As the world grows, the demand for electricity grows as well. At the same time, a reliable supply of fossil fuel has become more difficult and expensive to find, and the atmosphere has become more polluted. Since fossil fuels are used in almost everything we do, from turning on the TV to going to school, you'll notice the cost of just about everything keeps going up as well. Today, there's a need for a more eco-friendly, affordable, and renewable source of energy. We call that green power. One source of green power is the sun itself. But solar power can be difficult to harness and put to practical use. The sun's intensity varies depending on the weather and where you are on the Earth. This makes solar power impractical in many parts of the world. There are three primary ways we convert sunlight into heat and electricity. We can generate electricity on a large scale at a solar power generating plant. Or on a smaller scale by using photovoltaic cells. And we can heat liquids in a solar thermal heater. The sun has been used to heat liquids for centuries, ever since a human first left water out in direct sunlight. But it was a Swiss naturalist named Horace de Saussure who designed the first working solar water heater back in the 1760s. Saussure built a shallow wooden box, insulated the inside, then trapped water there. When he covered the box with glass and left it in the sun, he discovered that the water inside heated up to 228 degrees Fahrenheit, 16 degrees above the boiling point of water, without using a flame. Today, solar water heaters work on the same basic principle by transferring the sun's radiation with specially coated absorbers to heat air or water. Uh, for instance, if you ever had the experience of your garden hose in the sun, uh, you'll notice that uh, it provides hot water. Uh, this is the same principle. However, uh, we use an insulated box, we use copper to be able to heat the water to a higher temperature to which you'd ordinarily use within your home or your business. You can tell if a building uses solar heat because the solar collector is either attached to the roof or nearby. Unlike early solar heaters, today's passive solar heating systems are much more effective because they circulate water through copper tubes inside a specially coated box. Most have no working parts and require only local water pressure and sunlight to work. It's far less expensive to heat water with solar than any conventional fuel source. Number two is the concern about climate change. You don't need any fossil fuels which emit carbon uh, to heat water. Modern solar heaters start off as a plain roll of flat copper. The copper roll is first cut to the length of the tubes that will fit inside the solar collector. Then, the copper is put into a press where it is given its round shape. From there, a technician inserts the shaped copper into an automated welder. After checking that it is in precisely the right position, the welder combines an arc of electricity with an inert gas to create a flame that melts the copper and allows it to fuse together. 
Once the heat is removed, the metal begins to cool and solidify, creating a perfectly round, leak-proof tube. From there, the newly formed copper tube is taken to a stand where caps are welded onto either end. In this case, the four inch diameter tubes are then arranged in order on a rig called an absorber plate. There, they are welded into a series so that water from the top of one tube feeds into the bottom of the next tube ensuring that water will flow evenly through the tubes when they are placed in the collector. After checking that all the tubes are watertight, the whole assembly is put into an insulated metal case. The copper tubes are then sprayed with a special heat absorbing coating, assuring that the water running through them will soak up as much solar energy as possible. Finally, the whole assembly is sealed inside Teflon and a tempered, low-iron solar glass designed to capture 91% of the sun's rays. Solar can supply, you know, 95% of all your hot water heating needs uh, year-round. The solar water heater uh, will replace uh, what you'd ordinarily consume in fossil fuels, where it's oil, gas, electricity. Uh, the solar can provide that energy free of cost. Solar water heating devices are a relatively simple technology and are popular in places where there's a lot of year-round sunlight. There, more than 15% of all homes have solar heating, which provide about 6% of a home's energy needs. Solar water heaters cost more than conventional water heaters. However, when you look at the cost uh, over its 25, 30 year design life, uh, you're in fact gonna be saving far greater than you are if you have but a conventional water heater. Furthermore, uh, once you install the solar water heater, it'll last for 25 years, and you'll never have to pay again for that amount of hot water that's supplied by the solar. You become your own utility. Generating electricity from the sun's energy is a little more complicated. As far back as 1890, a Frenchman named Henri Becquerel observed that electrons in certain types of crystals are freed when exposed to sunlight and could be made to travel through an electrical circuit. The photovoltaic effect itself was discovered a long time ago in the 1800s, but the, but the actual solar cell itself was invented by Bell Labs in the 1950s. But later on in the 60s and 70s, these cells were made for space application to power satellites. Called photovoltaic or PV cells, these small wafers are made of special materials called semiconductors, a highly purified form of silicon, the second most abundant element on the Earth. This happens to be a material that is efficient, very efficient in converting light energy into electrical energy. Electrons are knocked loose from the atoms of the silicon to form an electric field, positive on one side and negative on the other. When light energy strikes the cell, electrons are knocked loose from the atoms of the silicon. When you create that one positive and negative, the positive layer, negative layer, when you create it that, you have electrons cannot jump across it. The sunlight has got energy in the form of packets of energy that comes and hits a solar cell and releases that energy and gives it up to the electrons. The electrons get all excited and be able to have enough energy to jump across the tube barrier. And when it jumps across, the frees up the electrons on the other side and flows back to an outside circuit. And the outside circuit could be a lamp, could be a television, could be any other appliance. Once electrical conductors are attached to the positive and negative sides of the PV cell, an electrical circuit is formed, producing electricity. It's very simple, it's very basic. There is no moving parts except for the electrons are the only thing that are moving. It is brilliant. And I think it is something that is going to be an integral part of our energy mix for the future of the world. A number of solar cells connected to one another and mounted in a frame is called a photovoltaic module. Depending on how much light strikes the module, modules can supply more electricity than a single PV cell. PV uh, solar modules work anywhere there is light. 
the amount of energy they produce is dependent on how much light you have. The more light you have, the more they produce. Multiple modules can be wired together to form an array. In general, the larger the solar module, or array, the more electricity can be produced. But PV cells have their drawbacks. The disadvantage of solar power is it is not available at night when there is no, when there is no sun. So your production of electricity is only during the daylight hours when there is sun. The power photovoltaic cells can generate is generally limited to small applications like pumping water, powering communications equipment, or providing electricity for a single home or business. It was another Frenchman, a mathematics instructor named Auguste Mouchot, who back in 1865 developed the first solar motor, the forerunner of today's solar generating plants capable of producing electricity on a large scale. By focusing a reflector on a glass-enclosed iron cauldron full of water, Musho was able to produce enough steam to run a steam engine. The same basic principle is used in solar plants today. The first thing you notice about a modern solar electric generating station is its large solar field, which can stretch for acres around the plant, and is made up of hundreds of parabolic trough solar collectors. Yeah, we've got a roughly 300, 320 acres here that we have mirrors on and it takes a lot of room in order to collect enough energy to make that electricity. The collectors contain thousands of mirrors that are curved and designed to concentrate the sun's energy onto a glass tube. They're called arrays that we have uh, parabolic trough mirrors that are made out of glass, conventional mirror, and a black chrome tube down the center and they're set at a specific distance so that the sun focuses on the mirror, reflects onto those tubes, and collects the heat from the sun. Inside the glass tube, there is a specially coated steel pipe filled with a thick liquid called a transfer fluid, made up of mineral oil and an additive to make it absorb heat. And as it goes through the array, it collects energy from the sun or heat from the sun. It'll come in at 400 degrees and go out at 560 degrees as the sun's intensity reflects from the mirror to the tube. It's a special product that we can use over and over for years. And it doesn't degradate or go away. It just uh, does its job every day as we flow fluid through these black chrome tubes. To concentrate as much of the sun's energy on the tube as possible, operators use sensors, microprocessors, and a computer to automatically monitor and move each of the hundreds of solar collectors. As the sun tracks through the sky, the computer tells the collectors to follow, consistently capturing as much solar radiation on the tube as possible. Once the transfer fluid passes all the collectors in the field, it's pumped into a conventional heat exchanger where the transfer fluid is used to generate superheated steam. And that steam generator takes the heat out of the oil and puts it into hot water, which makes steam to turn a turbine, which turns the generator to make electricity. A solar plant works like any conventional power plant. Steam is used to spin turbine blades, which in turn spin up very large magnets around coiled copper wires at very high speeds inside the plant's electrical generator. All electric generators operate on the same principle. Magnets plus copper wire plus motion equals electric current. It's quite simple. It's, there's a long process to get there and it does take time, but it's good all day as long as the sun's out. Unlike solar thermal heaters, however, that can only heat air or water, or PV cells, which only generate small amounts of electricity, Solar generating plants like these can supply enough electricity to power about 45,000 homes. As long as the sun's shining, this plant can run. It doesn't need coal, oil, it doesn't need nuclear. As long as the sun shines, we can make electrical power. Uh, the disadvantage is the cost. It's, it's kind of expensive to make uh, these plants. Uh, there's a lot of mirrors, there's a lot of glass. As the wind blows, some of the glass breaks, it has to be replaced. If you don't have clear blue skies and good intense heat, they, they aren't 
justifiable. They, they're not it's something that a person would want to have. Solar power is one of the least expensive renewable forms of energy and produces virtually none of the harmful gases that can contribute to pollution and global warming. We cannot continue to burn oil, gas, or coal to generate our electricity. We should be living within our energy means. If the sun is available to you where you live, you should use solar energy to meet your energy requirements. The average homeowner can save uh, literally hundreds of dollars every year on their electric bill. Furthermore, uh, their home will uh, certainly uh, be less carbon dependent. It's renewable as long as the sun shines, we can make power. It doesn't cost anyone a dime for that sun to come out of the sky. The future is enormous. When you look at the global warming, you look at the amount of pollutants that we put in the atmosphere out there, we should be looking at all possible clean energy technologies. So, the next time you turn on the hot water faucet or a light switch, think about the many ways you can use our natural resources more wisely and help make the earth a better place in which to live. You know, there's still a lot more to learn about the world and what makes it go round. And it's never too late to explore. You might be surprised about all the things you can learn. Until next time, I'm Christian. And I'm Katrina. See ya. Out there exploring.